Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Bunker. In this video, I want to show you my recent appearance on BBC News talking about Jehovah's Witnesses and the cover-up of child sexual abuse. Now, to give you a bit of background, as many of you know, I am involved with the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse for England and Wales, otherwise known as ICSA or IICSA. I've been involved with the inquiry since 2019. I've done a lot of work submitting evidence and explaining the many failings of Jehovah's Witnesses. And on September 2nd, the report for this particular investigation was finally released, resulting in a media frenzy while I was actually away on holiday, fortunately, I brought some of my gear with me so that I could do some media appearances, which I figured would be inevitable. And sure enough, on September 2nd, literally within minutes of the report being made public, I had these media appearances. There was an appearance for LBC Radio, one for Channel 5 News, one for BBC Radio, and one for BBC News, which, speaking as a Brit, <laughs> it's kind of a big deal to be interviewed on BBC News. So I was very humbled by this opportunity to explain the failings of Jehovah's Witnesses in front of this potentially huge audience. Of all of the media appearances that I made that day, Probably the BBC News one is the one that I'm most anxious for you, my viewers, to see if you haven't seen it already. And I figured while I'm showing it to you, I may as well give you a little bit of background and explain my thoughts. So this is Joanna Gosling on the BBC News channel. This aired on the 2nd of September at about midday. And yes, here is the segment in which I appeared. Good afternoon. Shocking findings which show child sexual abuse has taken place in most UK religious settings have just been published in a new report. The independent inquiry into child sexual abuse examined child protection policies in religious organisations across England and Wales. The report heard of multiple failings, victim blaming and blatant hypocrisy in the way major religious groups handle allegations. Well, joining me now is our Home Affairs correspondent, Tom Simons. Tom, tell us more about what's in the report. Well, just a bit of context, first of all. The inquiry, which has been going on for some years, looking at child abuse across British life in England and Wales, uh, it has looked at the Catholic Church. It has looked at the Anglican Church. This report is about all the other groups that make up some of the religious settings that we have in this country, uh, in particular sects of Judaism, of Christianity, uh, and, and of Islam. And the report is, is pretty damning. Um, it finds that some of these organizations are blaming victims rather than perpetrators, in fact, protecting perpetrators uh, f from uh, being uh, held to account. That often matters of sexuality are not openly discussed for religious reasons. Uh, religious leaders are abusing their power. Uh, men dominate the leadership of many of these organisations. Uh, there's mistrust of the police and child protection agencies outside the religions. And they're misusing the concept of forgiveness uh, in, in, a, in a whole variety of ways. Uh, I think it sums up in one, one quote, this from the report, religious believers can find it difficult to accept that members of their congregation or religious leaders could perpetrate abuse. As a result, some consider that it's not necessary to have specific child protection procedures or to strictly adhere to them. Uh, the, the inquiry found there often were child protection procedures, but there was a difference between what was said and what was done. So are there any specific examples of how failure to disclose is happening? Well, 38 organisations are, are looked at in this report. Mm. Some of them stand out. The Jehovah's Witnesses uh, was third in a list of religious organisations complained about in one study which the uh, abuse uh, inquiry did. Um, and, and one example of, of, of a concern the inquiry had was something called the two witness rule, which is uh, a, a religious uh, edict, which is very carefully followed by the um, Jehovah's Witnesses, which requires two people effectively to witness something which 
which uh, is then raised as an issue with elders within the church. In the case of child abuse, it can be one of the witnesses can be the person abused. Uh, but the inquiry said that the application of a rule like that in the context of child sexual abuse is likely to increase the suffering of victims, because, of course, most child abuse is not perpetrated uh, in, the, uh, in the view of any witnesses. Now, mm. the church does have child protection policies, and those protection policies do say that allegations should be reported to the correct agencies, but the inquiry is worried that the wrong uh, atmosphere is being created by this rule. So I'm just going to pause it there. We've just been hearing from Tom Simmons, the Home Affairs correspondent for the BBC. And as many of you will have noticed, Tom says something that is factually incorrect about the Jehovah's Witness child safeguarding policy. He says those protection policies do say that allegations should be reported to the correct agencies. That is not the case with the policies of Jehovah's Witnesses. The policies, as many of you will be aware, say that allegations handled by the elders should be reported to the branch office, and the branch office take it upon themselves to act as gatekeepers, essentially, in deciding whether policies can be reported to the secular authorities, depending on what the local laws say. And in England and Wales, there is no mandatory reporting, as Tom Simmons himself is going to allude to later in his comments. So this was a factual error in his statement, in his interview to Joanna Gosling, and to the credit of Tom Simmons, he actually wrote an article in which he summarised basically what he's saying here in this interview. I'm going to drop a link in the description below. His article is titled Religious Groups in UK Failing Children Over Sex Abuse, Comma, Report Says. This was obviously posted on the day that the report was released. I don't blame Tom Simmons for getting one or two things wrong. And he wrote, he included this untruth in the article that Jehovah's Witnesses have this policy of reporting abuse to the authorities. It would be wonderful if they did, and I wouldn't need to be doing all of the work that I've done for ICSA, because there would be no need, really, to complain about anything if all accusations are automatically finding their way to the police, it's because that's not happening that there is such an issue. Anyway, he included this untruth in his article, and to his credit, it was brought to his attention by an anonymous whistleblower whose name I can't divulge, but they managed to get through to Tom Simmons, and to his credit, he amended his online article so that it no longer perpetuates this myth that Jehovah's Witnesses are in the habit of reporting all abuse. Anyway, let's resume. Can change be forced within these groups? Well, this is a public inquiry set up by the Conservatives uh, uh, four, four or five years ago, and it does have powers to make sweeping recommendations. The structure of the inquiry means that it's done about 13 or 14 independent investigations into various areas of life. It's going to do a final report next year, and a key consideration in that report is whether to introduce something called mandatory reporting. Yeah. And effectively, it's quite a complex rule, but it effectively makes it a legal requirement for people in positions of authority working with children, that sort of thing, to report any, any, any concerns they have, any evidence they see uh, that children are being abused. It's a very technically difficult law to introduce. Uh, the government has been considering it for some time. A key question will be whether the independent inquiry backs mandatory reporting. And, and lots of people who have made allegations of child abuse over the years are, are, are desperate for them to do that. Mm. Tom, thank you very much. We can uh, talk now to Lloyd Evans. He's an ex-Jehovah's Witness elder and was a core participant for the inquiry. And uh, one of the reasons that he left the church was in part because of child, how child abuse was handled. Welcome. Thank you for joining us, Lloyd. Um, what's your reaction to what uh, is coming out in this report then? I feared it would be disappointing. And unfortunately, it has turned out to be disappointing from what I've seen so far. This is an investigation that received so much evidence of 
serious failings in the Jehovah's Witness religion. And I say this as someone who did spend uh, a year as an elder and over more than two decades in the organization, I've written two books on the group. There are very obvious uh, errors within the organization that are letting down victims and keeping abuse covered up. And what we're seeing in this report is a very wishy-washy uh, report that uses very muted language, doesn't say anything decisive and very much pulls its punches. What are the specifics, the obvious errors that you would talk about? We heard from Tom there about the two witness rule, which makes it obviously very difficult for somebody to report if they've been sexually abused. Well, I'm obviously delighted that, you know, the language that I'm seeing makes clear that the two witness rule is unacceptable, but that's just one of many problems that was brought to the attention of the ICSA inquiry. The biggest problem, as far as I'm concerned, is the harvesting of data on abuse accusations. CCJW were allowed to cherry pick a minute sampling of this data. It was actually in the statutory powers of the ICSA inquiry to go after the full data. They had this data at their fingertips so that they could know how widespread this problem is within the Jehovah's Witness group. I have extrapolated numbers of around 2,000 potential perpetrators of abuse based on data that came out of the Australian Royal Commission. And yet in ICSA's report today, they're bemoaning a lack of data in their investigation. I'm sorry, that, that's just simply not good enough. They had all of the data there. They simply refused to look at it. Why do you think that would be? My guess is, well, partly the problem is that ICSA is underfunded. Uh, when you look at the equivalent inquiry in Australia, the Australian Royal Commission, they received nearly double the funding to do an investigation for a population of nearly half or half of the population of England and Wales. So this is an underfunded inquiry. I feel there's also, if I'm going to be completely honest, an awful lot of deference to religion. I think there's a, a very much a culture of see no evil, hear no evil. And unfortunately, I feel that that goes all the way through to the ICSA, in ICSA inquiry. They are definitely treating the Jehovah's Witness organisation with kid gloves. I mean, obviously, they're not here to speak for themselves, but the reason that they're doing this inquiry is to um, try to put to one side the, the deference that there's been and, and what's been going on in these organisations that we were hearing from Tom, where perpetrators are protected, victims are blamed, and there's a mistrust of any external authorities that, that might be able to support the victims. So this was the point in the interview where things got a little bit awkward. I sensed that I was giving Joanna Gosling a bit more than she bargained for, She'd asked me an honest question as to why I felt the inquiry were being so standoffish in their investigation and not probing the data properly. I gave an honest answer about it being underfunded and the inquiry showing religious deference. And Joanna Gosling, for whatever reason, didn't like the idea of me just saying that without countering, oh, no, there's no possible way that the inquiry could be showing religious deference. So that was kind of interesting. I kind of felt like I was being lectured at that point in the interview because she didn't give me an opportunity to respond. I could sense in the tone of her talking and in the pace of her talking that she wasn't inviting a response to what she was saying. But all in all, I'm very, very pleased with how Joanna Gosling conducted this interview and how much opportunity she gave me to get across the main issues. So just to give you a little bit of background, I had almost no preparation going into this. I was asked to log in to, I think, Zoom for the BBC at 12 midday the report was released at 12 midday and I was supposed to only get the report at that time along with everyone else. My lawyer, Richard Scorer, managed to get special permission to call me a few minutes before 12 o'clock. I think it was maybe 10 or 15 minutes before 12 o'clock by the time he called. 
just to give me a very quick rundown of what the main talking points from the report were. So we had this really interesting conversation where he was basically as quickly and succinctly as possible uploading into my brain <laughs> the main things I needed to know as someone who was about to do a bunch of interviews where I would be asked about this report. It was so weird, but because Richard and I have been working together for months and we understand each other quite well, he was able to break down the report really well for me in just a very brief phone call and tell me what the main failings were as he understood them having only had himself not that long to go over the report. He told me about, for example, Ixa bemoaning a lack of data, which is just preposterous. He told me about Ixa coming down hard on the two witness rule. But he did make it very clear that it was, I don't think he used the word wishy-washy. He used the phrase, they've pulled their punches. And so I was able to read between the lines and formulate a basic response for the media. If I'd have done this interview later on in the day or in the evening, having had time to properly go over the report, I think Joanna Gosling would have had even more work on her hands. She would have had an even more angry interviewee because... Frankly, I'm still reeling from how negligent Ixa was in that report. And if you want a rundown of some of the main talking points, if Tibor is gracious, we will see a thumbnail here of the JW Watch episode that we did that day where we went over the report, myself and the panel, in more detail explaining more of the issues. But I felt it might be helpful at this stage in the interview for you to have that bit of background. Now Joanna is going to drill a little bit deeper <laughs> into this whole issue that I've brought up about the database, which, as I said, that was my main strategy going into this interview. Ixa has overlooked the database. I am sure as hell going to make sure it gets talked about. You mentioned there uh, that you believe there are potentially up to 2,000 perpetrators, but you base that on information in Australia. Are you, where are you, is, does that 2,000 figure relate to this country or elsewhere? Because obviously yes. uh, 2,000 perpetrators would mean a, potentially a huge number of victims. Yes, to be clear, the 2,000, it's actually 2,300, and that's for the UK, whereas ICSA is dealing with England and Wales. And that's an extrapolation based not just on the data that was gleaned from the Australian Royal Commission, but also the yearbook data that is published by Jehovah's Witnesses, because I happen to have a collection of yearbooks going all the way back to the beginning of when the data uh, is relevant, namely 1950. Um, Tom said that Looking forward in terms of where the inquiry goes with recommendations to try to root out sexual abuse, uh, one of the key things would be mandatory reporting. It's not a legal requirement currently. Presumably that's something that you would welcome. Do you think that would make a difference? Well, this is yet another reason why today's report falls so woefully short. Where are the recommendations? We've had no recommendation for mandatory reporting. I would like to see a recommendation for a far more probing investigation into Jehovah's Witnesses. No such thing. Uh, no recommendation for abuse data to be seized. And we know Jehovah's Witnesses are keeping this data because we have documented evidence that ICSA has seen, which they've ignored. And we also need legislation uh, brought in to stop institutions facilitating abuse by covering it up. So this was quite awkward. My earbud fell out at this point. And uh, <laughs> I just had to carry on with the show, you know. I was tempted very briefly to <laughs> rummage around and pick it up, but I had one earbud remaining that was still working and still feeding me the audio, so I managed to somehow continue. But I was really pleased that Joanna gave me that follow-up question, that extra opportunity to explain where this extrapolation of 2,300 perpetrators came from that, again, was the main issue I wanted to discuss. She then starts asking me about the mandatory reporting thing. 
And I said, uh, well, where are the recommendations? As it happens, there were two official recommendations in the report, which at that point I hadn't had a chance to look at. But they were so basic that they're, they're barely even worth mentioning. One of the two recommendations in the entire report was simply organisations should have a child abuse policy. <laughs> that was their recommendation. Even though in the same report, ICSA acknowledges that just because organisations have a policy doesn't mean it's being followed, doesn't mean it's being enforced. So I had written down a number of the recommendations that I would have liked to have seen. And when she asked me that question, I thought, well, I'm just going to rattle these off. These are the things that I would have liked to have seen. And from the phone call with Richard, I knew that the report wasn't recommending any of them. So somehow or other, <laughs> this awkward part of the interview worked and I was able to soldier on with just the one earbud. Can you just tell us a bit more about how the organize what you what you saw within the organization that you you didn't like and that led you obviously to leave i mean in terms of how it is that there is this mindset what how would you describe it well what caused me to leave the organization was that i moved to a different country and therefore there was a bit of a language barrier and i wasn't uh, taking in as much when i went to the meetings and so on and that caused me to start doubting my beliefs when I began doubting my beliefs, I did research uh, and learned that there was this huge problem with the way abuse is mishandled and in many cases covered up. Unfortunately, you know, the two witness rule is a major cultural reason, not to mention the insular nature of the Jehovah's Witness organization, why a lot of abuse allegations just end up getting swept under the rug. And again, all of this is documented. You know, they create Jehovah's Witnesses. If you go on their website, they have a, a scriptural position document that they've produced to try and use flowery language to make it all sound OK. But when you actually do the digging, this is what you need to do. You need to fully familiarize yourself with the policies, which ICSA had the opportunity to do. And only then does the full horror become clear. And you learn that, for example, you know, potentially hundreds of records are being kept at the Chelmsford headquarters with nothing being done about it so that the authorities can't intervene. So, yeah, child abuse was definitely one of the main factors in, my, in me distancing myself from the organisation. Lloyd Evans, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And if you want to get in touch... So, yes, that was my interview. I'm still kind of reeling <laughs> from having appeared on BBC News, again, quite a big thing when you're British and when you're raised in front of the TV, seeing BBC News and it being the trusted source of information on what's going on in the world, it was incredibly humbling to be given this opportunity, albeit speaking at very short notice, because again, I literally had a rundown from my lawyer, Richard Scorer, minutes before going on air and had to condense what he was telling me and make sure I was as truthful as possible with what I knew. It was a humbling opportunity and overall, I'm very, very happy. The only thing that really grates is my earbud falling out. But if that's the worst part of the interview, I'll take that. Um, the part where Joanna Gosling kind of corrects me, that was also a little bit irksome, but not something that I'm going to complain about too much. I actually think overall, again, she did an excellent job in allowing me to express myself and share some information that she clearly wasn't aware of and very clearly took her by surprise. Overall, I have to say the media exposure on that particular day was a positive on an otherwise depressing day because, again, the report falls so short in really being in any way decisive regarding the failings of Jehovah's Witnesses in particular at least on that day, 
there was a reason to talk about the issue. The very fact that the report had been released and mentioned Jehovah's Witnesses was a reason, an excuse almost, for the media to talk about this subject. So it was important that we jumped on that opportunity, we being ex-Jehovah's Witness activists, and used our very small window of opportunity to yell loudly and clearly, there is this huge problem, abuse is being covered up, there's literally hundreds of records being kept at the Chelmsford HQ on crime. Criminal evidence is being withheld on an industrial scale, someone needs to do something about it. So again, my main strategy was to effectively give that message and I'm satisfied that I was able to do that in this interview. There were other interviews that day, um, but this was the one that I was most happy with. And yeah, I wanted to make sure that my viewers saw it. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Hopefully it's not the last time I get to speak on the news on this subject. I'm actually quite heartened by the fact that there are, or there have been since the 2nd of September, journalists reaching out again, one or two who seem to be very committed to drilling down more on this story. I think they smell a rat. I think they realise that ICSA hasn't gone anywhere close to delving into this subject and finding out exactly what the problems are. So that's all I wanted to share with you. I hope you found this helpful. Don't forget to subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching.